By the way, we are uh, this is a pretty busy week. We've got uh, some responses to several of our projects that we need to visit with you in closed session, so we're going to need a considerable amount of time there for your input. So it might be work a little bit similar to the schedule of what we did last time. If you recall, there had been several members of the Bills of Texas Star HOA that had been represented by Mr. Tice, who was their president, and a couple of other property owners in there. They were discussing their desire because of the proposed commercial development on Highway 10, uh, that that could result in some cut through traffic through their neighborhood. And they have represented to you that they've been in discussions with many of the homeowners that live in that uh, residential community that have, would have a desire to have some type of gate placed at the Deborah Drive uh, double barrel um, area. And we took that general uh, request from them and visited with fire and police about the conditions under which the placement of that gate could be acceptable. And as we've kind of hashed through the issues from a conceptual standpoint, um, what we've really kind of thrown out to them conceptually would be the notion of placing a swing gate at Deborah into the subdivision there, Double Barrel, that would be emergency access only emergency access only, so therefore the typical specifications that would be required uh, dealing with Opticon system or some other type of controlled access that would only be controlled by fire and police would have to be in place. We have discussed with them uh, a location that would generally be where the wing walls begin to spread out towards Deborah Drive. Those two points that we've depicted are very, very significant because that angle has to be maintained for the site visibility triangle to be maintained. Um, so if there was some desire to shift that even perhaps farther um, towards Deborah, that, that, that would not be as a practical matter possible um, and wouldn't be allowed because of the site visibility triangle. So, We've thrown out conceptually that notion and that in addition to the swing gate, they also had a desire about the pedestrian traffic and there would be possible in this design to incorporate pedestrian gates and perhaps that could be controlled access as well through some type of keypad entry or, or, or something so that the folks that live within that area would have the pedestrian access. Now there's some obviously details <laughs> relating to <clears throat> sidewalks, public access that, that we obviously need to, to move through, but we kind of wanted to throw it out conceptually if you could work out the technical issues of what would need to be done. If from the HOA they were to come forward and say we accept full financial responsibility for the initial installation, we accept the financial obligation moving forward into the future for it to be maintained. The fire department requires an annual inspection of the gates to ensure that they're properly functioning. Would they accept uh, that? Um, if the HO came forward and said that we, we believe that we've got a very, very strong support on the part of the entirety of the HOA, and in particular, those that live east of Del Prado that perhaps would be most impacted by this if they had strong support, um, would that be something that y'all would consider? Um, for the HOA's part, what we just described to you conceptually, they're having a discussion with their HOA this evening uh, to provide a little feedback to us to be able to provide y'all about whether or not 
those conditions about the financial obligation, the impact of the gate uh, would have if that would be something uh, that's, that's acceptable uh, to them. One last detail regarding that would be the property owner here, um, you can see the relationship to the gate, it would be on the left side of the screen. The off street, I'm um, sorry, the on street parking in front of this house, um, in order for the gate to open, you would not permit that uh, parking to occur. Um, that homeowner um, has fully appreciates that fact and uh, the HOA represented to us this afternoon that that property owner would be supportive of there being no parking um, on there. Mike, remind me again how many homeowners are so concerned about this drive through traffic that you visited? What, was it something like 30? Um, yeah, that was a pretty pretty close number, but I, I couldn't honestly tell you how many individual homeowners that that represented. Um, the latest discussion with the HOA president today was that he would represent that they got near 100% uh, support of the property owners um, on the east side of Del Prada for this to occur. Um, and to the west, he, he wasn't sure, but he was confident that there was uh, strong support. And through what I'm hearing from some of the homeowners in that area is that there is only a very small contingent on double barrel that is concerned. And if you look at the drive through traffic, it wouldn't even be on double barrel, it would probably be on Longbow. I'm, I'm really questioning how much of that homeowners association wants a gate there. My, my real concern, this is probably a little bit strange, but these are public streets. I should be able to drive on any view of this public street. I don't care if I live there or not. And I don't think any neighborhood that has public streets should be able to put up a gate. I think that's just wrong. I have a concern about sidewalks. Are we, if I heard you correctly, they could, they could put a gate across their sidewalk that only a person that had a keypad could, could walk into the neighborhood? Let me back up a quick before we get to go too far there. Where some of this thought came from was uh, the area that is north of Ash Lane and east of Fuller Weiser, that subdivision there. Uh, I'm drawing a blade like Wildbriar. Uh, can, can you pull that up, Crayon? Mm -hmm. Let's do the wires for a minute. Or did you say that when that subdivision was built, there was a street that cut through the fertilizer. And uh, as it was going in, and these people bought the homes knowing full well that that street went through. As it was going in, they got concerned with that and approached the city council. And uh, I'll show you the map. To this day, that street is closed. Uh,
two access points if you, yeah. So the fix was to put a gate across there that only the fire department had access to. Everybody else had to go out onto Glade Road. So it's not without precedent. Sir, what, what was the purpose of that gate? Well, to, in this case, the developer proposed it as a single point of entry off Blade Road. The fire department said, no, we have to have two points of ingress and egress. So this was the, was the, the compromise that was reached. And that, this was not my staff, but the city council, when this went in, was, OK, we will, the developer will stub that street out. We'll put a gate right there. And the only people that can get in is the fire department or the police department. But the residents couldn't use it. Because that, and that's the key. We talked with Wayne a little bit more ago. You can't have a public street that is gated that only the elect gets access to. But you can close the street and only give access to the fire and police because they need that secondary point. If you go back to my slides here for a minute. Uh, and I think it was the first slide he showed. Uh, okay. Del Prado is a very typical example. Those apartments were built in the early 70s. There is one way in and one way out. That would never be permitted now. The developer wanted that, but now the fire department requires two points of ingress egress. When this subdivision was built, along with a lot of others, if the developer had his way, he would probably put a house there. He wouldn't have put another drive. But we require two points of ingress, egress. And it, in all of these little infill lots, there's a, there's this point of contention between, and I'm saying the fire department, I don't think it's a big deal for the police department, it's primarily fire. So that is a requirement. You have to design the thing with two points of ingress, egress. So, Left to their own devices, the developer would have never put one of those in. Uh, so it is, I guess all we're lifting up is, for, from a very conceptual standpoint, is, is it unreasonable to close that street and only allow the fire department access to it? The, the sidewalk is a, I, I don't think we can do it where we can get the, little kids in that subdivision access to it, and we can't give anybody else access to it. It's, I don't, I don't even have a, this is just an idea that they're floating. So it's, there's lots, a lot of details to be worked out. And if the fact of the matter is, there's no support for the concept, then we'll go back and report that to them. Uh, we didn't want to float the concept to y'all if there wasn't support from the HOA. What this, the mayor's saying, is a very valid point that we have to make sure that there is much wider support than from a few people. But we don't go anywhere with it until we determine is there even a little bit of support for concept. How, how many other act, uh, points of access are there to that subdivision? One. Just one on the team? Well, it, yeah, they, Del Prado was already was always there going to that. Yeah. That went into part of it. So there's a, there's a point right there. Well, you'd have one by the car that the yes. yes. That serves the other side. Yeah. 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 But for that little enclave of homes there east of Del Prado, it is the access off of Del Prado and the access off there. But I think you have to take the entire village of Texas Star, no matter what section they're in, into account. And about how many total homes are there? Do you remember that offhand? 112, yeah. just north of 100. See, to me, it seems like they just they don't want people going from Del Prado to the dollar store cut through the neighborhood. And that's exactly to, to me, that's just elitist, and I, I, there's no way I can support it. And I don't know what obligation we have to the man on the corner who says he doesn't care, but Winkley tries to sell his house. Yeah, and exactly. nobody can park in front of his house. And good luck for that property yeah. value. I think, just my own opinion, that 
let's let Dollar Store open up, let's see if there's an issue, and then if there's something that we have to address, we address it. But I think putting gates up around boats around your castle, I don't I, what I'd be curious to know is how many people on Longbow would be upset if that gate was there because it's much easier for them to access it from Deborah and come in that way than come in from Del Prado. I just think there's a lot of unanswered questions from the rest of the homeowners. I guess my contention is too the, the dollar that the general store was, was permitted by right. You go mm -hmm. in there, so it never came before council. So, I mean, we didn't have to really have a dog in that hunt right there because it's permitted by right. And, you know, it's whether or not those people were informed whether or not that's commercial, you know, or not, I don't think that's really part of the discussion. Right. Uh, I mean, but, it, and quite honestly, there are legal aspects of this that are challenges to begin with. So, I guess we'll take that by now because they're, they're legal concerns. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if it becomes a serious issue, then we'll go ahead and look at our options. We always do. Yeah. What are the legal issues? One of them is what I don't know what to say. That's not really that there is a pedestrian game. Well, maybe wine can put on that to this. The legal issue that we've been discussing is when you've got a public street and a public sidewalk that needs to be open to the public. We run into this a lot of times when you have developers who want to put in gated communities. They want public streets and public sidewalks in the city to maintain it, but they want to limit access to their residents only. And, and we can't do that. So we've got a public street and a public sidewalk. It needs to be open to the public. Now, there are ways that we could close the streets or vacate the streets, but you make them not public anymore, such that that could be done. But, uh, under the current status, we need to visit how we can make that happen. So there's, there's an issue we've got there. And I agree. I think Perry's got the right shot, the right angle. Let her up and see what happens. It's also an ADA issue, too, in your plane. On the sidewalk, it's an ADA issue. Well, as long as it's public, absolutely. Yeah. If you're going to restrict the access. And that's probably going to get in the middle of All right, I don't want to leave with the wrong impression here that this is some, this, uh, all of our staff is not on one line on this as well. This, uh, this, I mean, I brought up the, the past issues that occur on Gardner and the comments that it's not, there are many by which to overcome that if we, if we need to. Uh, so those on Darnwood and Pecan, those streets are closed. That's the main difference, is they're, they are closed, period. Are the sidewalks closed as well? I don't even think there are sidewalks. There's no, no sidewalks in Darnwood. Uh, and on Darnwood, I don't remember, but I don't know what we do. But the, well, in that case, I mean, even if the sidewalk did connect with, with uh, Fertilizer would be okay because there's no gate. It's it, there's a curve up there. It, it, there's not a gate. Uh, sure thing, so. Yes, sir. Okay. But it's, so I don't know if there's, we can pull that back up. But it's a, it, it, that's where you see black clothes. And we always have the opportunity, I think, when you do close the street. That's looking for the discretion to see. Yes. Now, obviously, you take into consideration. Residents out there, yeah. you make the decision on whether to keep a public street open to the public or not. So I don't know what that is. I mean, the college is there right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what? I have plenty of privileges. <laughs> 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 okay, oh, absolutely. <laughs> so, Mike, tell us about development in general. <laughs> that was prettier than that blue thing. Yes. 
not necessary to get to that. Uh, let's start in Glade Parks. Um, we are attempting to communicate with this graphic when we talk about Glade Parks, uh, what the status of the various components that make up the overall development. Um, and if that is not communicating uh, information clearly, please uh, let us know. We are going to show you an update on the bottom right uh, it indicates under construction would be the building 21 that you can see has gone vertical. Um, they would expect to be able to complete that um, in the next six to eight weeks is what Tom Wynn told me this morning. And the lineup of the end users that is indicated on the top there um, still remains the same. Uh, a lot of progress that's been made on the infrastructure to support that development, including the continuation of Rio Grande to connect into Cheeksparker that Mr. Craner has reported to y'all. There are uh, significant completion of the dedicated turn lanes that are a part of the service road that will feed you into the three primary ingress egress points off of the service road. Uh, you can see one of the entryway features off of Chisholm Trail, which is the second, um, or the really that's going to be the main um, entrance of the three, um, is under development. Let's shift to the Kayoff Manion, the single family development uh, there on the west side, uh, south of the urban lofts that have been developed. If you drive there on Red River, you will see that the masonry materials that will be included in the masonry screening wall um, are visible. You can get a little bit of an idea of what that's going to look like. Um, shifting to the Gateway Bloomfield subdivision on the east side of Gateway, their roads have now been poured. The interior spine road, they'll connect with the drive approaches to Gateway will be the next stage as soon as it dries out. Moving to the Dominion at Bear Creek, you can see continued progress. Uh, this picture is showing you the amenity center um, that is under construction. I think that they are now up to 18 um, out of the 206 total. Uh, subdivision that had been pulled. Um, this picture, I, I might point out that when we talk about the Villas uh, project that's proposed that we're going to talk about later that you're being asked to consider approval of the site plan, we're going to talk about the architectural design features. One of the quality standards that y'all had approved as part of the PD um, was that they extend the masonry to the side and actually have some architectural design uh, to that so that it's just not a blank wall. And that's a good example of how they've extended that use of that uh, stone material onto that side wall. Uh, again, just a picture that depicts the level of activity that's out there. The HEB family dentistry, we have now shifted to Main Street and Harwood west of the Albertsons. They are continuing there on the north side of Harwood on the development of that. Mike, are they moving from somewhere else? Or yes, ma'am. They are currently leasing space uh, farther south on the east side, and it's escaping me the name of it. But yeah, they, they've leased here for many years, and now they want to own their own property. Yes, sir. No. Yes, sir. And I, I can't remember the name. So. Um, there is a ribbon cutting for ice monkeys this Thursday, I believe. Um, you know, just kind of the sidebar. They came in wanting to put in a snow cone stand, for lack of a better term, put it in the middle of the parking lot and do whatever. And, um, mm -hmm. They, that is not permitted, but they were able to then go to this um, little strip shopping center owner and negotiate a favorable rate term um, to suggest that maybe having an occupant is better than it being vacant. And there are entrepreneurs that want to make a go of it, and they're very, very passionate. 
and it's actually a very good snow cone according to my kids. <laughs> um, we are on Airport Freeway at Nita and um, the eastbound service road. Y'all had um, seen previously where there had been a building that occupied this space as part of the airport freeway widening. Um, they, a substantial part of the parking that would support this individual building that's now been removed. Um, the owners of the property made a decision to demolish that building and create additional parking, more accessible parking that's more favorable to the primary entrances into these buildings. Um, they're doing, I'm sorry I didn't take a very good picture in the foreground, you can see some individuals um, that are on top of a new portico that they're building as an entryway into the building. They're going to duplicate that um, and use that as an opportunity to kind of doll up and um, improve the overall appearance of that property. The sketchers, um, in terms of the interior, exterior uh, work are nearing completion. Uh, they've got a little ways to go um, on the interior finish out before they begin to um, Bring in, bring in the racks and everything associated with the finish out of the store. And that's it. Ms. Jewel. Sorry. Interesting part. No. Yeah, do I dare say that I'm going to open the gates to the financial? <laughs> <laughs>
overall operating expenses at the end of May total $60 million, which is under budget expectations year to date by 4.7% or $3 million. The majority of the understanding at this point is coming from the timing of capital expenses. Looking at the individual funds, the general fund has collected revenues of $26.4 million, that's 78.1% of the budget expectations. Again, we're 67% of the way through the year. Property taxes are strong through May. This is the this is above prior year totals as well as budgeted forecast year to date, which is noted by that black line. Sales sales tax collections have been very strong. Only one month this year has been lower than the prior year for the same month. This contributes to our fiscal year to date sales tax collections exceeding both prior year as well as budgeted levels. Municipal court revenues vary from month to month based on case volume and the timing of payments. As you can see from the chart, that this is this fiscal year, every month has exceeded revenues from the prior two fiscal years. And fiscal year to date revenues are currently above prior year and budgeted expectations. Development revenues also vary on a month to month basis depending on developmental activity. Fiscal year to date, this revenue is higher than our budgeted expectations, but is lower than prior year receipts year to date. General fund expenditures through the end of May are at $21.4 million, or 59% of the budget. Our rental fund has seen an increase in revenues when compared to prior years from May. Fiscal year to date, the revenue source is exceeding both prior year and budget. Year to date, this revenue source is at 4%. Did we budget for that to be less than the prior year? For the whole year, we expected it to be level with last year's collections. Looks like it's less. That is the budget to date, the 2014 budget year to date. So we haven't completed the budget cycle yet. Those are just the eight months that we've gone through so far. The Water Wastewater Fund, our largest proprietary fund, fiscal year to date collections, total $11.8 million, which represents 57% of the budget. Our expenditures through the end of May are less than prior year due to the funding of capital projects in 2013 and total $12.4 million, or 58.5% of the budget. As of May 31st, Texas Star was 2,520 rounds below budget due again to weather conditions this year. The revenues per round is above budget as well as prior year. The decline in the number of rounds has resulted in an overall shortfall in golf revenues of $75,000 but when combined with the increase in the food and beverage revenues of 99,000, the revenues exceeded budget year to date by $25,000. $25, in operating expenses, through the end of May were kept below budget by $22,000, leaving the facility with a net gain of $137,000. Here today, revenues of Texas Star Sports Complex exceeded budget expectations by $52,000, and expenses of the complex were over budget projection by $22,000, but this leaves the facility with a net operating gain of $170,000, or $30,000 better than our budgeted estimates. Do you have any questions? Barbara, how can we on water revenue here? Can you it's, it's been pretty low. <laughs> um, I don't have the exact percentage right now in front of me, but we've been running about 93% of our expected of our expected consumption. 93% um, of what we had expected. So the, the revenues are definitely down. TRA is down, but they've also part of this, their normal fall payments that they want to skip. So. I know it's our, our expenses are below too, so mm -hmm. I guess that's going to balance it out, hopefully. Um, water is a problem. I guess it's that we've got wells down, so we don't produce too much. Yeah. Um, so we're trying to produce the production uh, from two wells. So that's uh, one now. Uh, yes. So uh, we're trying to be able to catch up, but it's, I mean, we need rain, and we did rain. We're a little concerned about our water, but 
surprising water economy that's reliability and the cost of it. So. We heard from CNN in the presentation again in pre council and a lot of issues of the future. So, good report. Thank you. All right. Any questions there?
10, it goes through 14, 14, 37. You can't come out with the means to apply grant on the best partnership. Emergency solution grant consortium. Item number 11 is uh, consider acceptance of the CIAC report. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'm going to stop right there. Let me go ahead and go to item 13 before we break the dinner to Mr. Porterfield's question. Uh, we not asking you to hold a public hearing to consider a resolution of uh, 1436 Fargo's apartment that. Uh, that the sport bill is referencing, and all your findings is that there are, you have no objection to it. You have no hard in whatsoever other than no objection. There was a letter that went out to the residents last week, and it got some of them a little concerned. We got some calls, but uh, my colleagues got some assurances from Tarrant County. Is that? That's a copy of the letter that was the subject of the questions. And then from the president of the management company of the apartments that is actually the applicant for the um, tax credit application submitted an, ac an explanation. The confusion was the belief that the property was being sold to an entity that identified itself as Lone Star. And in the explanation, you will read that as part of the qualifications necessary and to be awarded additional points for the tax credits, they need to partner with a not-for-profit entity. And as part of the qualification for the award of the points of the federal tax credits that they're used to finance the rehabilitation, they have partnered with this not-for-profit to provide services to the residents and the types of services that you can see here are everything from daycare, um, uh, I'm trying to remember everything, actual tutoring, job preparation, yes. parties, newsletters, all that. Thank I'm just you. guessing. Just guessing, guessing. So the clarification is no, it's not being sold to that entity, but instead they are partnering with that nonprofit, which is consistent with uh, the program that they're applying for the rehab funds. You verified that with Patricia Ward with yes. that Tarrant County Community Development. There's no change in the operation whatsoever. Uh, and then the owner, she is the owner of the company that will be here tonight. Yes, sir. The, not the property manager, but the owner of the company will be here to answer any questions. I don't know that we expect any objection from the resident. I hope we got your question answered. In fact, the individual that made the call, once she was provided that explanation, we didn't get a return call. Okay. All right, so that's uh, just so you know. So we'll hold the uh, that plan for after dinner and the uh, board of commission appointments and cover that quickly when we reconvene after dinner or start like that. Mr. McKay, the author of that letter that I distributed is Stephanie, it's from Stephanie Baker. She is who will represent them this evening. Uh, and then we'll cover those two items and then we'll run the first session if that's okay. So, and that is uh, Sonia, is it? Yeah. Did you yeah. Happy birthday, Mr. Stephanie. So, good choice. All the ones. 29 and over. Those are in our That was great. <laughs> I'm set. I'm set. I'm set. I guess, I don't know. <laughs> Just a little later when I got here. Well, I started at 4. I go to 5.30. And then they take their break to lunch oh. or dinner here. Well, that's what they're doing. So it'll be about a half hour. Yeah, anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes break. And then they'll come back and consider this other agenda item. And, yeah, they're just going over the agenda item here and the seven o'clock session. I don't know how they do it. Yeah. Thank you. And then, uh,
but they go into the closed session here uh, after they discuss this public hearing or uh, the uh, site plan. The site plan they have to do boards and commissions. So it's. Uh, Oh yeah. They do their closed session. Closed session topics are up here. Uh, hey, Al, how's it going? Good. How are you? Well, I got a small question. Uh, well, I got a small mind, so I may be able to handle that <laughs> small question. The shutoff valve at the street. Uh huh. Yeah, are they supposed to be vertical? Oh, yeah. Normally. Because I got one at the 45 degree angle. It's hard to turn off. It's almost impossible to turn off. How do I get that first of all? We just need to put in a service request and have them come out and change that. It's at 1004 Fayette Drive. Yeah. I've got uh, doing some uh, changing out a few valves, shut off valves that don't shut off water. <laughs> So I need to shut it off in the street in order to do that. Just call in a request. Okay. Just put it on water. Yeah, my next door neighbor, Kenny, had one. They were out of town. And I tried to go up and turn their water off for them. I tore every knuckle I had up. Finally, he said, no, I've got a special tool in my garage. And with that, I could actually get it turned off. But then they well, called. Yeah, it. that they're very. I've got one of those. That, you know, water. What do they call it? Water keys. But then doing it, you can get it on. The, no, it's, it's, yeah, and that was their problem. Pair of pliers. You can't hold it. It's deep too. It's, it's probably a foot and a half deep. Yeah, and it's almost arm lengths to start with. Since then, they've had. They called the city up there and had it changed, <laughs> which is good. In case I ever. Had I'll just call it. Well, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Do uh, you come to pre-council very often? Oh, a couple, three times. I haven't come in here ages, so uh, uh, I'm quick on it. <laughs> Yeah, if you come to summer classes. Yeah, I thought it was early and I didn't realize it was seven. I knew they came in here at four. Yeah, they come at four. Do they, uh, I've got it all on tape. Oh, yeah, no, I, I, I know you yeah. have. We wanted to show you first, uh, give you a little reminder of what the concept plan that had been approved as part of the overall Riverwalk plan development looked like. On the left side of the screen in the yellow is the Dominion single family project that we've been providing you regular updates. The arrow that points to the M1.1 that is on the east side of Bear Creek Parkway, that is the NRP urban loft development that is under construction. The M1.2 would be property that could also be developed as urban lot that the NRP has got a right of first refusal on that uh, to purchase for a future phase of the urban development work. We're virtually certain that they're going to exercise. The property that is the subject of the site plan consideration um, is there in the brown there on the hard corner, that southeast corner of Bear Creek and Midway. Of note, there were two, at least two permitted single family, I'm sorry, there were at least two different types of residential development that could have been constructed there. Um, it could have been either single family detached, which is what's being proposed, or it could have been attached townhomes. So again, what they are proposing to be developed would be the single family detached as opposed to the attached townhome development. As part of the ordinance, every one of the types of residential development corresponds to a specific lot type. And in this instance, the type of single family detached housing product they're going to be developing is referred to as a lot three. And that basically means that it's gonna have a alley with a garage that's accessed from the rear. And then corresponding to the lot type, there is a specific, there are 
types of street frontages, and there are types of, of, um, of um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought, street types and frontage types, excuse me, um, that are associated with the development of that. So the development that you will see proposed uh, in the site plan is consistent with what has been approved as part of the overall development standards associated with the residential development. So what are, what are they proposing? They want to develop a 60 lot subdivision that would be single family detached on 4,000 square foot lots. They would be constructed for each individual lot with a 15 foot rear setback and five foot side setbacks. This would be constructed again with rear access garages that would be accessed by alleys that are private alleys and therefore along with all of the common areas and the masonry screening wall that will be constructed um, around the perimeter of Bear Creek Midway and the Mentors Chapel will be the responsibility of the Homeowners Association to maintain. So between the front building line of each individual lot and the back of curb of the street, there will be a four foot parkway and that four foot parkway will be planted with street trees that will be planted 30 foot on center. Mike, can I ask a quick question? Yes, ma'am. Will there be parking on the street as well? There, yes ma'am. Um, there is specifically um, just as you would on any subdivision, there would be um, on-street parking, um, yes, on-street parking permitted. Okay. Streets are standard width. Yes, they're standard width. Um, consistent with the Dominion that's under development, we've shown you pictures of the entryway features, the um, masonry screening walls, the landscaping, you can expect that same level of quality uh, that will be incorporated into the uh, elements of this subdivision as well. And these would depict the examples of the type of home that's being specifically designed uh, for this lot size. And it's consistent with architectural design features that y'all has adopted as part of the overall ordinance. collection in the front or the back? It will be in the front. Mm -hmm. And does this activate the build out of Winters Chapel Road? That is a very, very good question. The, the Mentors Chapel Road that is to be built follows the existing right of way that is the current, am I saying that correctly? The new Mentors Chapel is being constructed within the existing right of way. Um, as part of the future development to the south that will occur, there will be a need to revisit or visit the issue of whether or not the existing right-of-way will be abandoned in, in order to create a new alignment that would be consistent with the curvature of the existing Bear Creek Parkway. But uh, that's, that's a discussion that will take place for future development specific to the extension of Mentors Chapel Road for this, this stays within the existing right-of-way. And whatever they do in the future will connect with this one? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is a little bit unusual in that the, the land use was determined at the concept plan? Yes, sir. This is a site plan. And, uh, so it is a ministerial function. The lot type has already been specified, and really all of that was specified in the concept plan. And I, the way I try to look at this is the, uh, it, it's, it's an upgrade from the houses. It's, it's, it's less density, and if they're fairly nice homes, it wouldn't necessarily be something that, you know, and I would prefer a larger yard. This is very small, but it is, upgrade from the townhome and it is allowed by the right because the lot design is already specified. So your effort here tonight is to make sure that they are adhering to those uh, 
coming out there will be in the common areas, not the individual that's on the bottom. I'm just curious, do they have anything with projected price point yet? Uh, we're being told in the 300s, up for 200s, really? 300s. They will, uh, you know, the minimum 17, but they've got the average um, over 2,000 square feet and with what they're paying for the dirt and how it's amenitized. Um, it'll command a price. And this product sells, I mean, my experience is that this, this kind of product sells much more quickly than the time the concept price. I'm sure. Our last item there is on the board and commission department. We've got some that are uh, closed session discussion, but the uh, Ms. Kim has provided you a uh, list there of what the discussion is and what some of the recommendations are. Uh, Animal Shelter Advisory Board, Mr. Byron has agreed to. Uh, I think we may have to adjust the times. We, we may have to work with him with his schedule, but uh, to at least get us through for a while on that. And then we would ask that the uh, place that is designated for one who has to do with the daily operations of shelter, that you would designate not by name, but by title of the city manager that you need. Uh, so we would, most likely that would be how, but it could also be James. Uh, with. Can we change that city manager or designee? Oh, it is designated. Or designated. It's not designated. It says city manager or his designee. Yeah. Change it to designee. Move to his part. Okay. Why? Why? Because that way we won't have to revisit it in the future. Well, the city manager is the one doing the designation. But it may not be right, a Well, you just taking the gender reference out. Oh, it's. Yeah, I thought it was probably more. Here's my kind of operation. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Eagles Development Corporation, which is, we can discuss in uh, closed session. You see here, this is a recommendation of Mr. Thompson. Uh, Parks and Leisure Services, we, do, we uh, don't let that anything. We think that's okay until October on that. Planning and Zoning Commission uh, is, is what we would recommend to you would be uh, Ronald Dunkel, and uh, I'm sure that can be discussed in closed session. Uh, tax increment finance, bring that to zone number three. We would recommend Mr. Price. Zoning Board of Adjustment, alternate number two.